Welcome back to the Metal Exchange. Justin and Chris here with you for another week. How are you, my friend? Very good. Uh, it's good to be back on uh, what feels like a, a regular schedule again after some, you know, delays and early recordings and traveling and all that. So it feels like we're kind of uh, back in a groove, which is good. Yeah, I'm looking forward to this episode a lot. Vicious Rumors, welcome to the ball. Um, but before we get there, just a couple of things that I, I heard this week that really kind of caught my ear. The first one, and I actually sent this to our mutual friend Justin because I know he's a huge fan of Scar Symmetry. But there's a band out of Canada called The Design Abstract, and they came out with an album this week called Transhuman Ascendant. Uh, it was like the closest thing I've heard to Scar Symmetry, which uh, was kind of cool. And I, and I say that because it's melodic death metal, but it's very like spacey keyboard heavy and stuff like that. And I just thought it was like a really pleasing sound for that kind of music or what have you. I don't know if it's going to finish in the uh, the top uh, 50 necessarily, but it's definitely something I'm going to check out and go back to throughout the year. Uh, and another band, which is more of like melodic doom with a touch of death metal because of the vocals, a band out of Chile called Weight of Emptiness. They came out with an album this week called Withered Paradogma. Really, really good stuff. I need to spend some more time with this. It is, I want to put it on the list of stuff that um, I I need to give some more time to because I could see this easily finishing uh, at or near the top of the list. It's a really cool album um, out of a band that I had never heard of. Apparently, it's their third release. They had two prior albums, both of which came out in 2017 and 2019, respectively. But uh, really, really good stuff, good production, and and definitely worth checking out. I'll, I'll post a track or two from each this week. Nice. Yeah, that first one particularly sounds interesting as that is the kind of uh, MDM that I tend to enjoy. So um, that sounds cool. I, I Since the last time we recorded, I really have not listened to anything new. Um, really, just pretty much the the same albums, uh, the more recent releases like Haken and Galneria. So I don't really have much more to say about those. And uh, next week I have... Um, on the radar, the new Frozen Crown, Ice Age, and Nanowar of Steel albums will be uh, the ones I focus on next week. So maybe next time we talk, uh, I'll have more to say about uh, new stuff. But uh, uh, I actually listened to this Vicious Rumors album uh, about five times this week. Just really wanted to uh, really let it sink in. And, and I have to say, by the, the fifth go around today, I, I found myself like really recognizing the songs and, and enjoying the album quite a bit. So the, um, the, it was cool hearing something that I really just had never heard before. So it's funny because this is an album where I think every song does sound kind of distinct. I don't know that every song sounds the same like other albums, um, but this is a band I have kind of a, a, a history with, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second. Um, but short of like the occasional playlist where I may have thrown a song or two on there. Is it fair to say that you'd never given the album a full listen before this week? Uh, no, it's definitely fair. I pretty much could say with authority that I've never listened to the album <laughs> start to finish before. Um, so. the, the, I came, uh, stumbled upon these guys in like the weirdest way. Uh, back in the early days of the internet, I think I had posted something about sabotage on a message board. And I get a message on AOL or instant messenger. I don't recall what it was. It was around the turn of the century. And I got a message from someone saying, Oh, I see you're a big sabotage fan. Um, my band used to tour with them. Have you ever heard of a band called vicious rumors? And I had to plead ignorance at the time. I had never heard of them. Uh, and it turns out that it was actually uh, a striking up a conversation with their bass player at the time, Dave Starr. And uh, really nice guy. Um, I actually reconnected with him recently. I uh, He's suffering from some health issues right now. I sent him nothing uh, but love and affection and the best uh, of health for him going forward. But it was really, really nice because he, back again, I'm going back over 20 years, he sent me this album in the mail. And he's like, you need to listen to this. I think you'll, I think you'll like it a lot if you, if you like um, that, you know, late eighties era sabotage stuff, basically everything right before gutter ballet, I think would be a, a very fair comparison power of the night, stuff like that. Hall, the mountain King. And, um, I play this cassette and I just 
fell in love with this album and I was curious to see how it was going to hold up. It's not something that I listen to every week, although I do listen to it from time to time. Um, and, and I've certainly got thoughts about that, but it was, it was weird that I found out about this band from, from one of the, you know, one of the members that had been in the band for a number of years. Um, they've had many lineup changes over the years and I'm, I'm not going to waste the whole podcast going through it because they've had over half a dozen singers and, uh, the, the one constant factor here uh, is is Jeff Thorpe, their guitar player who does backing vocals. He's one of the guys who I saw on 70,000 Tons. He, he was playing with them. But then the rest of the lineup was different back in 1991 when this album came out. So that's kind of a little bit of a backdrop as to why I, why I chose it. Um, and I, I was really, I don't want to say excited, but I was curious to get your thoughts because I think I, I think this album is pretty accessible and I had a feeling it might click with you or at least some of the tracks. So I'm, I'm looking forward to getting into it. Yeah. I found out about this band because I saw a poster of them in your room in high school and was like, who the hell is <laughs> vicious rumors? And, um, but I, I don't recall, I don't, I can't remember if you ever actually played them for me or if you did and I just forgot, but um, I yeah, just remember and- you had that poster and it was just like, okay, like, uh, that's interesting. And I think you had gone on to tell me the story that you just told. And, uh, but it would took, it would take, um, another 25 years for, for me us to, to talk about it. listen to the album. So here we are. Well, kudos to you. It had been on the list. Um, it was actually an album that, uh, our mutual friend Todd had guessed as what we were covering last week when we put something on our social media page, kind of soliciting uh, guesses for, for the power metal band that we were going to cover. Go but stars. The, what was that? Yeah, go go stars. stars. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you got that going for you. Um, but that, that long story short, he, he was right. We were going to cover the album. It was just a week later that we, we got to it. So shout out to Todd. Um, but yeah, this, this is, uh, this is kind of the quote unquote classic, um, Vicious Rumors lineup, and it's Carl Albert, the late great singer on on lead and backing vocals, uh, the aforementioned Jeff Thorpe on guitars, along with Mark McGee, Dave Starr on bass, and Larry Howe on drums. Uh, and and what's what I found interesting, and I realized this back in the day, but it was kind of reaffirmed this week. This came out on Atlantic Records, which was kind of a big deal at this time. If you that were on was Atlantic, Sabotage's label at the time, right? That's right. And that's also why they toured together, I'm, I'm sure, because Atlantic probably put them out. And if I'm not mistaken, and don't quote me on this, I believe they helped support them on the Gutter Ballet Tour. I believe that's the, the connection here. But, how, um, how far back does the band go? When did they start or get, get their start? Vicious Rumors, you mean? Yeah. So they... <laughs> Uh, apparently they got together in 1979, but they didn't really oh, start wow. recording albums until, you know, considerably later. Uh, their, their first full length release was called Soldiers of the Night. It came out in 1985. Uh, they would release an album, Digital Dictator, in 1988, a self-titled album in 1990, and this was their fourth release. And then they would wait a couple of years before they would come out with a follow-up. Uh, you know, and, and, and to be honest with you, uh, Carl Albert would wind up passing away, uh, which is a, a story that we'll get to in a little bit. But th- to make a long story short, I think that kind of set the band back. And I don't even know if they were necessarily going to continue um, after his passing, which is, you know, obviously very, very tragic. But we'll, I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later. But um, this, as I said, was kind of their classic lineup. But it was at an interesting time because I feel like so much changed in and around 1991 that, you know, again, it was like, right at the very end of the hair metal craze and right at that cusp of, you know, the, the alt rock movement with Nirvana right. and Pearl Jam. I feel, I feel like we kind of land on this time period quite a bit. Yeah. Like we always land back in 91, whether we're talking about Pearl Jam or vicious rumors, but it's kind of like, it's such an interesting time period for, for metal because it's just in this, in this state of transition from, you know, the, the hair metal, heyday of the eighties into the, the kind of the, the thrash or the, uh, not thrash, but the grunge, the grunge rock scene of the early nineties. So, um, yeah, and this and, is interesting and, that it kind of falls. Um, it's only a year before the, the Manowar album that we spoke of, uh, not that long ago. Yeah. It's kind of that, like, 
it's just a really interesting time because you can certainly see the transition. And I think that having gone back over the years and dabbled in some of the band's earlier material and even their follow-up album, Word of Mouth, which, would, like I said, would come out three years later in, in, in 1994, that was kind of the last full-length release with Carl Albert on it. The, the, the band's sound was beginning to change, and I think that they were trying to kind of keep up with the times, but at the same time, um, you know, remain – true to their to their uh, to their earlier sound in my opinion the first three albums are just a little bit thrashier a little bit heavier in spots and i feel like this is more homogenized in many ways and i don't say that as a bad thing if anything i think it's more accessible than some of the earlier material because it's it's very melodic and and very catchy and i think accessible um but just a little different than some of the earlier material than that um that is out there uh but yeah just kind of coming full circle on this at 32 years old, uh, on April 22nd, 1995, Carl Albert passed away. He was in a car crash and he died, obviously, unexpectedly. And that just kind of set the band on a little bit of a different course after that. Yeah, that's unfortunately another parallel with sabotage. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, so, I mean, parallels abound. Um, when you had a chance to listen to this, maybe not necessarily after the first listen, but as you kind of was getting, getting through it with the second listen and the third listen, did you find that there were certain songs that you were gravitating towards more than all of them? Or was it just a pleasant listen for you throughout? There was a couple that I liked particularly more than, than others. Um, but I also found that, um, different songs reminded me of different bands and different singers. And, and as we go through it, I'll kind of point it out, but um, I thought there was a lot of cool uh, parallels. There's that word again uh, to just uh, like just different styles, different bands, different singers, dif- just all different things. But uh, overall I, I, it was a very uh, enjoyable experience. I don't really know if I had any real expectations going, going into this, Um I think maybe I would. I thought it was going to be more thrashy than it was, and and so I'm kind of, I kind of liked it better that it wasn't because it kind of mixed in some more traditional power metal elements with that kind of, kind of West Coast thrash. It, it made for a really cool kind of uh, marriage in my, in my opinion. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I hear a lot here. I hear bands that came before them. I hear bands that would come after them. You know, just certain things that I picked up in terms of. Um, you know, certain tracks stood out to me for different reasons, especially having gone back to it with the, with the benefit of hindsight, but um, we'll get, we'll get through it because uh, we'll get to it just because I'm curious to see if what I hear is kind of similar to, to what you picked up on um, as we go through it. But the, the album starts with one of the songs that I saw live, ironically enough, and the song is called abandoned. Um, Although I think this is a, one of, how do I explain this? It's let me start it this way. It's actually one of my least favorite tracks on the album, which is ironic because normally they kind of start you off with something you know really catchy and something that kind of grabs you right away. This one is more mid paced, kind of anthemic in nature, and not so much thrashy, but just kind of a straight up heavy metal song in my opinion. Uh, very very crunchy opening riff, very very tight. But for some reason, I've always thought this song was slightly overrated when you compare it to the rest of the album, much of which I just absolutely love. Um, but I, when I hear Carl Albert sing, I think on this track, I, I, it's like a mix between Ralph Sheepers and an early John Oliva, in my opinion. Again, just me. Um, but other than like the, the guitar solo, which I, I think is particularly good. I, 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 I just don't love this opening track, which is kind of ironic because normally I gush over the first track. Yeah, uh, I, I thought it was good. I think it, it kind of, um, it, it kind of like makes you think that the album's going to go in maybe a different direction because the, the rest of the album doesn't uh, follow a straight line, um, and it, it, you're not you're not going to hear like a, a, like eleven songs that are like this first track. Um, it kind of reminded me a bit of, um, we talked about that, uh, the Black Sabbath track that was in Wayne's World that kind of starts out with that, like, really heavy riff just to kick things off, and it's just, like, this real crunchy, speedy kind of song. Um, 
it's uh, it's interesting to hear a song like this, like in 1991. Um, I, I feel like it it's kind of like uh, something that. I feel like would have come more from like the late eighties thrash kind of, uh, time period. Um, so I, I like this. I, it's a good song. I, it's not my favorite song on the album. Um, but, uh, I thought it was kind of a cool, like, um, a, a beat kind of way to kick things off. Um, like energetic and, and, uh, I feel like this would probably come, be kind of cooler to see live um just like a fun just head banging kind of tune but uh well that was a solid way to kick things off it was very heavy when they played it live like it just it 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 had a little more punch to it in a live setting than it did on the album and i I don't say that to be a bad thing if anything i think i actually enjoyed it live more to your point um but it just packed a little bit more punch whereas the rest of the album is not so much in this vein. The rest of the album, for the most part, is a little bit cleaner, a little bit more polished, I guess, in certain ways. And I don't know that there's a better example of that than You Only Live Twice, which is the second track. Do uh, you have any thoughts about this? Because I, I have some strong ones. This is my song of the week. I love this song. I thought it was the best song on the album. I, I thought it was... Um, it just It kind of starts out like... I, I couldn't put my finger on what that like that kind of um that quiet kind of uh, acoustic guitar at the beginning it reminded me of something I just couldn't figure it out but then it just like kicks off into um a, a, a speedier song but it's just um super melodic the the chorus is really catchy I just this was the song that I just like I immediately the first time I listened to it I was like oh damn like this was first of all like very different from the first track. Um, but it would turn out to be um, this and, and another song I'll mention later on um, were my two favorites on the album. But this one, I, I think, just a hair, uh, a hair ahead was my my favorite on the album. I, I presume it was uh, your favorite as well. Yeah, this is my this was was going to be my song of the week, and normally I, I would um, I would just say, all right, this is our song of the week. But I, I have a, I had a backup plan. Uh, but I love this song. But uh, before I tell you my thoughts. Let's uh, let's give it a listen, and um, we'll come back, and I'll I'll share my thoughts in a bit. Yeah, anyway, I I think you picked a perfect song of the week. I love this song. I think that the drumming is absolutely out of this world. It's so melodic, and and I think it just grabs me more than than Abandon does. Um, A phenomenal, catchy chorus and a guitar solo that would have made Chris Oliva proud. I just think this is like a phenomenal song, and like they wound up playing – this on 70,000 tons as well. I did not see this, but I'm going to go on YouTube as soon as we're done recording because I want to see what I missed. I I have a feeling that uh, there's something out there for it. So really, really good song. And then it goes into another album, another song, which is really, really good in my opinion. And that's called Savior from Anger. Anger. This is another like tight little banger, very well constructed and quite a bit thrashier than, than the two songs before it, in my opinion. Um, I also love how the instrumental section on this just kind of slows down a little bit and then goes kind of back into it after, after uh, when, when they go back into the verses and the chorus. Um, it reminds me of something that you'd hear on Megadeth's Countdown to Extinction, like not the really thrashy, you know, peace cell stuff, but like that middle era of Megadeth where they were still thrashy, but kind of more with the mainstream components to it. Uh, really cool stuff. And also, I think the bass lines on this song are just absolutely fantastic. For an album that came out well over 30 years ago at this point, 
the production is very, very good. And like, it's not something that really needs to be cleaned up. Whereas a lot of the other albums that we've talked about from this time period could have been well served with a, with a remaster. This one, this one holds up very well sonically. Agreed. Uh, I, maybe it's a, uh, something to be said about Atlantic because, uh, Sabotage's Streets album, which came out the same year, uh, also still sounds very good, uh, all these years later. Um, th- this song reminded me of a band that wouldn't exist for another seven years, uh, after this, and that's Primal Fear. I thought that mm. there were parts where, um, Carl's vocal sounded a lot like Ralph Sheeper's and just, um, it kind of that, thrashy kind of earlier kind of primal fear vibe that almost had kind of like a Judas priest tribute band kind of vibe to it. Um, th- yeah, I like this song uh, a lot too. I thought this was really catchy and uh, the part where he sings savior from anger. I he really sounds like Ralph Sheepers just in that moment. I, I thought it was uncanny. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And, and it's funny because you're, you're not alone. Um, when this album came out, the Washington Post said, and I quote, takes its musical marching orders from such aging British headbangers as Judas Priest. And then it goes on from there. But it's ironic that they were talking about Judas Priest as aging 32 years ago and they're still touring. <laughs> they're, they're still going. Yeah, they're still going. So if they're aging, that means they're like like fine wine at this point because they've been around for another three decades. And if still- Judas Priest was aging in 1991, I hate to hear what they had to say about Paul McCartney. Oh my God, forget about it. And who's also still going strong, mind you, but I, I, I digress. Um, and then we get to one of the more interesting tracks on the album and it's called Children. It actually it clocks in at just under five minutes. And I guess that makes it the real epic uh, on the album. Um, what are your thoughts on this one? This to me sounded like, I, I can't, I don't know if there were any songs that actually were played on the radio, but if this feels like this would have been their, their radio hit, um, it, just sounds like a rock song that you'd hear in 1991. Like, I feel like it's a, a really perfect picture of its time. Um, a really, um, just uh, like, I think a radio, like a really radio friendly chorus, just very, um, I feel like you could, you'd hear it in like a early nineties kind of movie. Like, I feel like it could have been in Wayne's world. Um, just a solid song, a little, like kind of a mid tempo, um, kind of an easy listening compared to the rest of the, the album, I would say. Um, just, uh, but just a kind of a, kind of a cool track. Um, I, I thought it was uh, very accessible, I guess would be the word. It's almost like a power ballad in the sense that it has these really simple, but beautiful riffs that start the start it and kind of, I don't know, like take you through for most of it. Just very, very simple. But these like, soaring vocals over the top um, with a very simple but catchy chorus. And, and I got to be honest, even though it's not my favorite track, it's probably in the top two. And, and it just gets stuck in your head for days. And so I'm actually going to make it my song of the week because if it wasn't going to be yours, it was going to be this one. So let's give it a listen and I'll kind of sum up my thoughts when we get back. I, I echo some of your sentiments exactly. Not only is this like the radio friendly, accessible single, but it's just like, I don't know, easy listening for, for a metal album. 
I love the acoustic guitar outro at the end too, where like you hear the kids playing in the background. I feel like this just screams MTV music video. Like you can almost see them on the playground when they're doing it. I was, a video. I was literally going to say the exact same thing. That's um, I feel like we're really uh, in sync today. <laughs> I, I, I agree with you. Um, but ironically, not a song that they played live on this tour, which was, was a little surprising to me. Uh, and then we get into track five, which is called dust to dust. This one to me has really, really strong vibes of Queensryche in both the intro and the outro, which is kind of the same. But the whole middle section is more of like a poppy thrash tune. It's got the thrash components, but with that, like, we're still trying to get on the radio bit with the pop thing going on. And I, I think the drums are just the real standout here with a kind of a cool riff that, that goes through most of this thing. Um an underrated tune. I, I don't know that I necessarily appreciated this one as much when I was younger, but I think that going back to it, out Al, between Albert's vocals, which are some of the best on the entire album, I actually like this song a lot. I the beginning reminds me a lot of um, Chris Oliva, like you know those kind of gutter ballet or Edge of Thorns kind of, or even on streets like those kind of mellow guitar openings that lead into a song that's, you know, a little bit heavier. Um, I, scr- I think of like Scraggy's tune yep. or like something like that where, um, but Queensryche also definitely um, same, same type of vibe. Um, yeah. This is another like just solid kind of um, another mid tempo kind of song, but just has like a, a, a nice kind of uh, gate to it. And, and it's a good like headbanging type of tune. I, I like this song uh as well, I don't know that I have there's even too a much bass more solo to add. on this thing, which is kind I'm of. I'm sorry. Uh, there's even a bass solo on here. It's like understated, but it's you know it's cool that they threw that in there, kind of giving a nod to uh, something you don't always hear. Um, that kind of wraps up like the front end of the album. The, the, the album only has 11 tracks, and and these are not by and large the longest tracks. Uh, there's one other track that we'll call an epic because it too is almost five minutes. But for the most part. Uh, that's a ballad. So like most of these songs are short little bangers. Um, and, and quite frankly, I think that um, raise your hands is really no different. It, it, I think this, that's part of the appeal of a lot of these songs is that they're just like in and out and, and yeah. they don't overstay their welcome as we've talked about other like songs can do sometimes. Um, I, so agree. I, I thought that made it an easy listen overall. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, and like I said, this next tune, raise your hands, not my favorite maybe even less thrashy than some of the stuff that's come before it. This one is a little more proggy in ways. And I actually hear like fate's warning on this one. And I, when yeah. I say fate's warning, I'm talking about fate's warning of this time period, like that late eighties, very early nineties fate's warning period before they were going full on, like, you know, prog metal, but just a take you were getting tastes of it um, around this time, like around parallels this is not my favorite song, but it does show off Albert's like vocal diversity. And I like how they layer his vocals in spots. I thought that was a nice effect as well, but I, I just hear so much fate's warning on this track. Uh, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Um, has that classic, like a bunch of dudes screaming, you know, like raise your hands. Like, <laughs> yeah. um, like kind of like metal. Of one- Saint. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like a metal one Oh one kind of tune, but, uh, it's solid. It's, um, it's not one of my favorite songs in the album, but uh, as I as I've said on many occasions uh, on lots of albums we've talked about, I, I didn't think there were any bad songs on this album. Nice. Um, what do you think about Strange Behavior? Uh, this was a another song I think that is a touch slower, but by no means is this one a ballad. Um, th- in my opinion, very 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 good tune. Um, the backing vocals remind me of something that Anthrax would do on that album that we had covered back in the archives, the one that you absolutely loved and begged me to do a second time because it was so good. Uh, but kidding aside, like these little bass lines that are come throughout this thing are fantastic. It's a simple song, but it's really effective. And quite frankly, song's probably better or, or I enjoy it more than it probably should because it's nothing special, but it just really clicked for me. I, I think that Strange Behavior is a good one. Yeah, I like this one too. I feel like this is another one that would have been, I think, a solid radio song. Um, another, I feel like it's another one that's just kind of uh, on the mid on the mid tempo. It's probably my favorite of the mid tempo songs. Um, 
just a really just catchy song, good riffs. Um, I, 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 uh, I liked it. Um, but I, I could, this is another one where I could kind of see a, a MTV music video going on in a, I don't know, in some like burned out neighborhood, some kid just like throwing a rubber ball against the wall. I don't know. Like, I like it. And if not, you, you've got a new career as directing music videos for songs that came out 32 years ago. Yeah. Or whatever. Eat your so, heart out, Spike Jones. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, as we kind of get towards the back end here, I, I think that we, there's some of some very interesting tracks as we kind of wrap this thing down. And I, I don't necessarily say that in a good way. Um, but one of them is not Six Stepsisters. I actually don't love this song. It's a really fast tune, kind of a galloping number. Um, and, and, and it has thrashy elements, but I wouldn't call it a thrash tune. It's just a little too repetitive for me. Um, the chorus is quite good. I, I I just think it's so similar to the rest of the song that it doesn't really stand out as some of the choruses earlier on in the album. Um, but it is interesting that they would throw a drum solo on this thing out of nowhere, which is kind of you know not the most common thing for a for a band like this. Yeah, this is another one that kind of took me back to like early Primal Fear. It, it felt like because I guess like early Primal Fear did kind of feel like power metal with a little bit of thrash that was sprinkled in and that's kind of the vibe i'm getting from this song as well also not one of my favorites uh but also you know pretty solid um i believe it's one of the shorter songs on the album so uh, it doesn't uh it doesn't you don't get tired of it because it's over before you can uh so um but you know pretty good tune um that's about all i have to say before we take a trip back to Alan's basement. <laughs> we go to mastermind um, who's talking incessantly for uh, the next four minutes while we cover this one. No, but th- this, this song, I, I didn't remember as much as some of the other stuff on this album. For some reason, I kind of lost this one to time. It's got these odd verses, but they're kind of catchy. Uh, whereas the chorus is kind of a miss for me. I, I actually prefer the verses to the chorus on this. And it has like this, anthemic march like quality to it which is it uh, can be good i just i don't particularly think that this is their best song i will say this though and i i think it bears repeating the mix is fantastic and when you listen to this song with headphones they do some effects with the vocals which are kind of like the psychedelic vocal effects which make it worthy of a listen even though i don't think it's the best song on the album yeah, I, I liked it better than Six Step Sisters, maybe not by a ton. Um Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, uh, it it's 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 a good it's it, it's um they have like a lot of songs that seem to be this kind of tempo to it. Um and I think that like some are better than others. I don't think this is the best one, but I don't think it's the worst one either. Um kind of middle middle of the the road. Um the 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 vocal effects again. It's reminding me of something, but I just can't put my my finger on what. Um, I think I'm just. Uh, I think my brain is just completely f- filled with music to the point where I don't know what's what anymore. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, uh, we're we're getting towards the end here, and um, I, I, I'm curious to see how you feel about these these last two tracks that kind of close out the the album. Well. The first of which is the real true ballad on the album. I think even more so than Children, which has that power ballad feel yeah, to it. Definitely. When Love Comes Down, um, <laughs> it's funny. I You talk about songs that were kind of made for a music video. I feel like if this song had come out two years prior, it would have been a gigantic hit. Like if, if, if Vicious Rumors puts this song out in 1989, this song is top 40 everywhere and whatnot. But – they, it's almost like they missed the boat by coming out with this song when they did. And all I think is like really tight guitar solo, really big hair, and and quite frankly, just White Snake. Every time I hear this song, I think like this is may as well be like the second coming of David Coverdale's White Snake. I was gonna say White Snake. There you uh, go. So we yeah. agree. Just uh this is like a very nineteen eighty seven power ballad. Like it, it's it would, I think it would have been, you're right, it would have been huge. It would have been a music video in an abandoned warehouse with a lot of fans and hair blowing everywhere and And they would have smoke. sold out arenas just from this one song. Like, I feel like that's how big this song could have been. Yeah, they were four years too late. Yeah, to well, I, I'm, I'm saying two, but I'll, I'll give you four just the same. It's like, 
they just it, it this this is a song that will be forever lost to time because they came out after it should have if that makes sense right but it also like it, it kicked in the middle it kind of kicks up like some heavy riffs and stuff and, and yeah. it's not like it's not like a softy the whole way through um it, uh, yeah. it, pick, it picks up some steam in the middle and uh it's a pretty solid song I, it's one of my um one of my favorites on the album actually and uh, mostly because it just it really stands out as being something very different from everything else i agree with you Although when you talk about different, I, I actually think that the last track, Ends of the Earth, is really different and almost so much so different that it's almost an outlier. It feels like it should be either a bonus track or a song that like, I don't know, it just has a different feel than the rest of the album. And I think it's more like less thrash. It, it's not really thrash meets hair metal, which a lot of this stuff is. To me, this almost feels like the start of the American power metal movement with bands like Crimson Glory and stuff like that. Um, it's very hard for me to compare this song to anything. It is a very solid tune. It just feels misplaced, uh, but a very powerful tune. And, and again, a very, very good vocal performance on this one. Yeah, this was my um, my second favorite song on no the kidding. album. It would have been my song of the week had not been for uh you only live twice which was my favorite song but i i just thought that the um the the bridge and the chorus are just super catchy like that that's the thing that i think i took away most from those two tracks is that they had the catchiest choruses and that and that kind of just sucked me in because um i feel like a lot of the mid the mid tempo songs in between all these tracks in the middle um they kind like none of them really stood out to me, um, they, they all were solid, but um, this song, I think, just because it's a little bit faster paced and and just has a just is really just more catchy and more melodic, so it just kind of uh, it really caught my ear more more so than most of the songs, and it, it's also the shortest song on the album at just just over three minutes. Um, just a really cool. I think it was a solid way to kind of kick things off the, with the uh, the power ballad into this like real fast. Uh, in and out kind of speed, you know, speedier tune. I, I thought it was um, after like two okay songs. I, I thought they really f- finished strong with these last two. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. And I'll, I just want to amend one thing I said earlier. I think I may have said that they toured with Sabotage on the Gutter Ballet Tour. It was actually the Streets Tour um, because it was for this album in 1992 that they they did their they did their tour, and it was Atlantic kind of pushing them out to, to do it. But they did a four month run of shows with sabotage which what a show that must have been back in 1992 i have to say very very cool um and and also the the video for children did receive considerable play on headbangers ball which is which i guess makes sense because it really i mean you can you can almost visualize it um i'll i'll post it this week when i post my song of the week and i'll actually post the video of it it's worth it's worth seeing if you've never seen it yeah i i didn't realize they even had any uh, music videos so that's that's cool i'd like to see that yeah awesome um so you know as as we kind of like wind this down did it meet or exceed your expectations and and what would you give it for on a scale of one to ten well i had no expectations so it exceeded my my zero expectations, Non-existent expectations. yeah, yeah. That, that um I, I thought it was really solid i give it a uh a, a solid seven um i i liked it uh quite a bit um couple of songs that I liked a lot. Um, but uh, I thought it was a very easy and enjoyable uh, listen for something that I really had just no knowledge of going into it. Nice. Um, again, a bit of a nostalgia pick here, but it, it holds up for me so well. And I used to play this album a ton. As, you're, as you said, I, I did have the poster that that came along with the cassette of, of this that I that I got back in uh, 2000 or whatever it was. Um, but yeah, I, I I'm a big fan of this album. I think that even though it's not flawless throughout, it's just something I wind up coming back to every so often and just like really just smiling when I listen to it. It's probably a 7.75 for me. I I wouldn't give it an eight because there are like two or three tracks that I just think are not as strong as some of the others, but by and large, this is just a fantastic listen and a real trip down memory lane for me. Yeah, I'm glad you chose it. Uh, as always, I really enjoy listening to um, some of these things that I'm just not familiar with and just passed me by for whatever reason. It's kind of a, a make good on, on not being able to listen to as much stuff back in the day as, as possible. So 
Uh, yeah. Good stuff. Uh, well, well said. And I just want to bring up one news item before we kind of do some housekeeping uh, things for, for the next two weeks or so, or the next week. Um, a, a, a band that I just never really paid any attention to kind of from the same era. And that's uh winger is releasing their album called seven later uh, in May. This has gotten a lot of, uh, I see a lot of people talking about the new single that came out for this uh, for this album. It's called Proud Desperado. I haven't had a chance to listen to it yet, but it seems like it's getting some buzz. I, I, I'm curious to see if this is something that you've either checked out or had was on your radar. I think I had seen an email from their label that they were coming out with a new album, but I have not heard um, the single. So uh, I'd be curious because, geez, I, I mean, I haven't heard anything from them since, you know, Beavis and Butthead? The early 80s, late, or, uh, late 80s, early 90s. So um, I'd be curious. I mean, if it's good, it's good. Uh, we'll if, uh, it post shot. it this week. What was that? You should post it this week. Yeah, but I, I definitely will. I, I, I'm, I'm curious to hear it. And, and I want to be honest, um, I have no idea what to expect. I, I think I've listened to one of their albums, maybe two, but it's just not something that's like usually on my, uh, on my radar. And I just think of Beavis and Butthead when they would make fun of you know, winger. So that's, that's all I got for that. A uh, little bit of a slow news week here, which uh, should be interesting though, because we've got uh, some stuff in the queue. You want to talk about what we're going to put out uh, later this week? Yeah. Uh, we haven't had a, a, a interview or a conversation, if you will, in, in a while. And uh, I had this, uh, um, I'd wanted to do this for a while because um, one of my favorite uh, albums so far this year has been the, uh, the album Infinity's Wings by Skyblazer. And um, I happen to be friends with uh, the mastermind of uh, Skyblazer. There's that word again, mastermind. <laughs> uh, Johannes Frickholm, uh, also known as Johannes Skyblazer. Um, and I had been talking to him and said, I would really love to have you come on the podcast and talk about this because um, it's it's his band's first album. They had released an EP prior um, and I just think that uh, the timing is great because the al- the album just came out uh, in January. Um, it's obviously uh, very inspired by Power Quest, who just happened to call it uh, call it quits. Uh, also, I think it's it's very much inspired by Tommy Johansson and and uh, the Sound of Majestica, formerly Rainseed, and and Tommy even went a- a- so far as to uh, publicly endorse this album. Um, online which i thought um i'm sure johannes must have been over the moon um i i know i would have been um so he's going to join us uh that episode will drop on, on thursday morning and we'll talk to him about kind of uh you know his influences and, and his uh process in, in putting the album together and, and uh the songwriting and i just thought it would be kind of cool to, to give him a little bit of uh a little bit of the um uh, spotlight uh, and to talk about the, this album, which I just think is really great. Um, uh, it's, it's uh, to me, if, if there's not going to be a power quest anymore, I, I think um, Johannes is going to do a hell of a job kind of uh, carrying on that, that mantle, so to speak. And uh, so we'll get, we'll get into that with him, but um, that's the, uh, that's the plan before uh, our next uh, album discussion. And what is that my friend? Because I believe it is your choice. Yes. Um, so this, I, I, I always say, like I've had some a couple of things in the in the ba- in the back pocket, and this one I've put off for whatever reason. But uh, it's a band that I'm a little surprised that neither one of us have chosen after 140 plus episodes, because <laughs> um, it's kind of an obvious one. Um, but I'm not going to choose the obvious album. The band is Labyrinth. But I'm not going to choose Return to Heaven Denied. I have a feeling you'll pick that at some point. I'm actually going to choose their first album, No Limits. Um, this was my first Labyrinth album, and it's the only Labyrinth album that actually has Fabio Leone on vocals, or Joe Terry, if you will. I, the, the whole band went by stage names for some reason on this album. But this is just one of those very nostalgic albums for me i remember vividly uh pat giving this album to me at the halloween concert at coney island high uh this and um i want to say this superiors behind album i think were the two albums that he had purchased for me 
Um, I had been wanting to talk about this for a while. Um, I, I who was one of our, our uh, listeners also uh, I think chatted with us about this album uh, a few months ago um, and was talking about how the um, I think there was like a, a single that had different versions of, of some songs or whatever. I, I, uh, you might have to jog my memory as to who it was we were talking to, but um, I, I think it's about time that we talk about Labyrinth. And uh, but uh, yeah, I just feel like um, not a lot of people talk about this album. It's always Return to Heaven Denied yeah. or the the newer stuff. But um, this one, I feel like, kind of fell by the wayside. This is a good choice. Um... I guess the, the, the obvious choice would have been returned to heaven denied without, you know, getting too deep in the weeds there. That album is one of the greatest power metal albums of all time. Which this, is why we're not going to talk about it. Which is why we're going <laughs> to hold it off and make you wait for it. No, um, kidding aside, this is a really interesting album. And I, for, for reasons which I'll get into when we record, but, um, a very interesting choice. I was not expecting this. So uh, I look forward to listening to this, to revisiting it. And I'm, I'm curious to see how it holds up because I, I do not remember the last time I've, I've given this a full listen. Yeah. I think it would make for a, an interesting discussion. It's probably the earliest Fabio Leone material that I'm familiar with. I'm not sure if the, I believe he was in a band called Athena that might've predated this, but I don't know that I've ever actually, listen to much of it um this no, is really have like to cover that then that's a that's a that's a story for another day yeah i think i want to say i ha- i had i had rhapsody's legendary tales before i had this album so that was my first experience and it only came out a year after this uh, he had left labyrinth shortly after this album was released um I, I i just remember being really surprised because i felt like stylistically and i think we mentioned this when we discussed vision divine's uh debut album that he had a way of sounding totally different than he did with rhapsody so um oh he's a chameleon it's amazing he sounds nothing like he did with rhapsody um and that athena album that you mentioned that came out in 1998 so okay uh, it was definitely after this as far as i know this is his first um you know, full length recording. And then it would be sh- shortly after this, it would be vision divine and Rhapsody and everything else that he would get involved in. And now Angra and, and a million bands in between. So uh good choice. I look forward to this. This is I'm just, I'm just one. looking at the cover art and just the nostalgia, just from looking at that simple, but effective cover art, just uh just reminds me of just those early days of, of getting a, a, an imported CD and just feeling like, like so excited to hear something that like you wouldn't be able to just walk into a store and pick up. I, I know it probably doesn't make any sense to, to the younger folks out there, but yeah, that's, that's we, you, before iTunes uh, and Bandcamp and, and Spotify <laughs> the we have to go to, to listen to, go to, to a to damn it. store or, or get somebody to ship something from Europe and Japan. Like uh, I think I actually had the, the Japanese version of this album, I think maybe nice or maybe Korean. I remember the, the spine, uh, the, the, like the, it was in another language. And so I had to flip the disc over, uh, where the other side of the spine was in English so that when it was in my CD rack, I could actually see what huh. the hell it was saying. Well, it's going to be a fun listen. Um, I have vivid memories of, of enjoying this album over and over and over again. But it's been a while, as I said, so it, sh- it will definitely be fun. A great choice. Um, if you like what you hear, please give us a like and a follow. Commenting on our stuff helps other people find it. It's all part of the algorithm, so thank you. We appreciate your support, and we will uh, come back to you with uh, some new interview on Thursday. And then, of course, Labyrinth's No Limits on Monday. So uh, enjoy the week, bud, and I will uh, catch up with you in just a couple of days. All right, pal. Have a good one.